Uh, a warm welcome to everyone to the, today's webinar, uh, Hands-on Experience with LR1110, Lower One Transceiver with GNSS and Wi-Fi capabilities. Um, my name is Luka Mustafa from IRNAS um, in Slovenia. I'll be your host um, today. Um, so a brief introduction for um, those of you who've uh, joined at this moment. Today we have an interesting panel of experts um, covering various fields of the LoRaWAN ecosystem. Uh, Thomas Telkamp is joining us from uh, Lacuna Space, uh, working on LoRaWAN space connectivity. Orne Brocker is uh, joining us uh, from the Netherlands as well. Um, he's the author of ChirpStack, uh, LoRaWAN network uh, server and the stack. Um, so covering the stack part and integration with the uh, LoRa Edge ecosystem. Fabien Ferrero is uh, joining us from uh, France. He's been working on the RF side um, of LR1110 and various LoRaWAN devices, and I guess you guys have seen various of his talks and content uh, already. And uh, myself, Luca Mustafa, coming from Irnas in uh, Slovenia, where we built advanced uh, IoT devices. Um, so a brief introduction uh, from my end um, and a brief summary of uh, the blog on LR1110, and then we'll jump to um, short introductions uh, from our panelists, and then we'll open up the floor uh, for questions and a more open, free-flowing discussion on this topic. Um, so as uh, you guys maybe have seen, uh, at DIRNAS we are doing uh, applied IoT projects, um, all from wireless optical communications to specialized IoT. Uh, devices and as such we get faced with a lot of very interesting use cases um, that require the best and the latest in uh, technology as such and that's why we're always at the forefront of testing new things as they become available. Um, jumping to one of our favorite animals, uh, rhinos, we see how delicate of the balance is to build a technology to save animals uh, with the best possible performance while also meeting all the very critical requirements um, of the actual application. So particularly rhinos are interesting because we wish to build something that can be implemented inside the rhino horn. And for the past two years, we've actually been working um, on this with uh, smart parks, um, creating implantable GPS trackers. However, um, we weren't exactly happy with the battery life we could put in such a small space. So that's one of the reasons why we started looking at LR1110 that early on in the process, uh, as soon as it was uh, announced. Um, looking at a typical application of using a U-Blox or you know, a standard GNSS uh, receiver in a LoRa tracker, we see actually that we use the majority of the battery just for GPS fixes. And with that, uh, we definitely have room for improvement. And that's something we'll be talking about uh, later on today. From a different perspective, we've been working with uh, Lacuna Space uh, and Smart Parks on different applications, uh, coloring uh, elephants um, and yeah, tracking them for a longer period of time. So while it is very nice that elephant is a large animal and you could put a large device there with all the batteries, um, there's always a lot of room to improve uh, in terms of uh, the data granularity to get more uh, location information, either through GNSS or even through Wi-Fi scanning for a local positioning uh, or well, seeing uh, what locations are revisited uh, most often. Um, and lately, one of the more popular projects uh, working with, for example, pangolins, um, yeah, it's a small, animal that goes into tough to reach places, uh, as small as the device is, um, as you know, longer will stay on the actual animal without being uh, torn off. Now I've spoken about a number of animal use cases um, and a number of you are definitely coming from more of the industry side. Um, and what we typically say is, this are very nice use cases to try new technologies and really push the edge of them so we are very we're worst with them and actually uh, have good use cases to translate them into industry because essentially these are one of the uh, tougher cases one can imagine. 
Um, so jumping right into the topic, um, the LR1110 from Semtech uh, is a very interesting solution combining the LoRa and LoRaWAN receiver uh, with the security element, uh, Wi-Fi passive scanner and a multi-constellation GNSS uh, scanner as such, all in one chip, um, all at a very affordable price. And as such, uh, this is a game changer for a lot of the applications I've mentioned earlier, and as well for a wide range of different use cases. Um, so on the blog we've posted earlier this week, and I believe many of you have read, if not, uh, please visit our website and you can see all the details there that we'll be mentioning uh, today. Um, our motivation for doing that was making the first dive into this technology and seeing how well it works, uh, seeing how easy this is to implement and also to gaining the first hand experience so we can most effectively integrate this into new solutions uh, with our global range of clients to build new and awesome products as soon as possible. And overall, we've seen that this unlocks plenty of new opportunities. Um, so the setup we've been testing in this case uh, was to compare this to an existing tracker. Um, so a device you may have seen that we've built over the past years, a very tough epoxy blob for uh, GPS tracking, which, well, looks like this uh, inside, uses the best in class uBlox uh, GPS receiver, um, and pitch that against uh, LR1110 to see the actual performance. Um, so to have this running, uh, we've used one of the um, Semtech evaluation kits with LR1110, uh, linked it to the Things Network uh, by building uh, Node-RED integration uh, to talk to the LoRa Edge, did the uh, resolution of positions, and then ran the experiments to see the results. Um, so quite a few interesting things uh, we came up with. Um, keep in mind, this is very use case and setting specific, particularly when compared to the traditional GNSS receivers. Um, so comparing Zoe 8MG uh, with LR1110, um, we see the errors are generally in the comparable range when you average them. Uh, the maximum errors may differ um, at certain uh, points in time, and we'll talk more uh, on that uh, when we discuss the solver part of the solution. But the real magic uh, is that the average time to fix uh, with LR1110 um, is uh, fixed. Um, smaller than 4.5 seconds for single constellation and doing multi-constellation, we get to that number, being very, very power efficient. And actually we see in the say use cases, if we run a fix every four hours, um, yeah, we are at least 10 times more uh, efficient uh, compared to the traditional GNSS receiver. Um, obviously a question we always get on the solutions is how precise is it? That's why we have looked at the distribution um, of uh, positions, evaluating errors and seeing uh, how accurate the two solutions are. And they are reasonably comparable under the uh, experimental setup uh, we've uh, made, generally in the 30 meter range of accuracy, um, subject to settings, of course. Um, further details are available on our blog, so we won't be diving deeper into this uh, today, but feel free to ask questions in the chat later on, and we'll try to answer all of them uh, as we go forward. Likewise, we've discussed uh, the degree of precision, um, which is one of the open topics at the moment, which we'll be looking into um, as we go forward, as we want to understand the position of every uh, GNSS fix uh, we get. So really seeing, um, so we know how accurate the fix is. Um, and currently for both solutions, this is not uh, ideal as we can't correlate the actual precision uh, with the degree of precision we get uh, from each of the two solutions. However, we see an advantage in LR1110 that it uses a cloud solver, um, which can be continually improved. Uh, versus something that's you know, fixed hard in, uh, in hardware and uh, you cannot uh, change it as such. Um, and the most fun topic to compare and what really makes or breaks uh, the actual application is the energy consumption. 
So to get a real feeling of this, um, it's important to combine both the energy required for a GNSS fix, as well as the energy to transmit that information, uh, particularly because uh, the set of data is much larger with LR1110 um, than with uh, a traditional GNSS receiver, where we assume about 10 bytes are usually employed to send this data, whereas, whereas yeah, LR1110 is 40 to 51 bytes. Um, and looking at the results, again, further details in the blog, um, we see that uh, it does largely depend on the spread factor um, used, but LR1110 is an order of magnitude lower power in a lot of the typical applications we would see. And today is really about looking at the imagination, like what can we envision with this solution? What can we build and discuss all the uh, drawbacks, all the potentials, and where can we go this, with this next? So for example, for the Rhino implant, where we can go with this technology is from 12 months of a fix every four hours to 100 months um, of a fix every four hours, or vice versa, yeah, let's run this only for 12 months and have a fix much, much more often, uh, which gives uh, better data quality. Um, given the size and compactness of the solution, GNSS plus the LoRaWAN receiver, super small devices can be built, say, under 3 grams or under 30 grams for, say, bird tracking, and also additionally employing uh, Wi-Fi scanning if this is more closely related to urban environments. Um, some really game-changing solutions can be built with this. And likewise goes for asset tracking, like very small asset tracking. Um, for, for example, if you would be tracking parcels, this could be an ideal solution, low power, small and cheap, uh, versus all other options um, and so forth. And we'll definitely discuss this further today. Um, but also there's another set of applications which we call Turtle, but likewise can relate to a lot of other things is where you have your device exposed to free so to actual uh, open space um, to get the GNSS signal for a very short period of time. In the case of turtles, this is them coming out of water and yeah, getting a fix in a very short period of time. But likewise, there's a number of other applications uh, where devices may be intermittently outside uh, and you can get the fix really at that point as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so this was a very quick um, overview um, of the state of technology today and of what we have been doing um, at IRNAS, creating new solutions with our clients and partners and really uh, envisioning new devices to build. Um, and now I would like to ask uh, Thomas to present their experience and their view on what can be uh, built with this um, as lacuna space and our applications. Okay. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, Thomas from Lacuna. Let me see if I can share my screen. Where is this? Should be the one. Perfect. Okay. I assume you can see my screen now. Um, so let me start with briefly introducing what we do for those uh, who don't know. Um, so we have uh, at the moment one satellite uh, in orbit uh, to pick up LoRaWAN messages from anywhere in the world. Um, uh, these, these devices, the, the, the LoRa devices are as close as possible to a terrestrial device. So it's the same frequency, it's the same software, only with a minor modification and a slightly different antenna, which I will show later. The satellite picks up the messages when it's passing over your device. It stores them, and when it's over a ground station, it will pass them back to the ground, to our backend, and then we will redistribute them to any existing LoRaWAN uh, uh, backend. So that can be uh, the Things Network, the Things Industries, ChirpStack, or or anything anything else. So. Your device is very close to what you have already terrestrial, even the same device can work both on gateways and on the satellite and on the back end, you will get your messages as if they came from a gateway. So application wise, there's nothing different except that you can do this anywhere in the world. So a simple device looks like this. Uh, so it's, it's very small. Um, obviously the antenna needs to be pointing up. Um, so let me first show you how the satellite orbits. 
So the satellite roughly orbits uh, about the, uh, over the poles. In the meantime, in about 100 minutes, 94 minutes, it's uh, circling around the Earth. In the meantime, the Earth is rotating. So in that way, it basically scans the whole globe in 24 hours. So with one satellite, you can send one message per day uh, to the satellite. Um, the, the area it covers is slightly different than what you see here in the, in the video. But you see the device sending, the satellite picks it up, it drops it off at the ground station, and then we forward it back to all the existing uh, networks. So it's all end-to-end -end secure, just as is LoRaWAN, because it's basically completely LoRaWAN based. Let me very quickly show it again. So the satellite is orbiting, the Earth is rotating, it basically scans the whole Earth once per day. You can upload your uh, message as, as long as we have one satellite. Later on, we will launch more satellites later this year, and eventually we will go to uh, about three hours uh, uh, interval uh, somewhere next year, hopefully. So the satellite is scanning the Earth, the device sends a message, it waits until it's at the ground station, it offloads it to the ground station, and it's sent back to your application. So that's what we do at Lacuna. Let me now switch to the LR1110. So we have been very lucky to be uh, early involved in, in testing this device because it's such a brilliant match for what we do. Um, so here you see actually an, an, an actual uh, Lacuna device. On top you see the antenna that's manufactured and uh, designed by, uh, by Fabien, who will talk later. Um, uh, it also sends uh, on, on the ground, so you can use the same antenna also to reach your normal gateways. And for the rest, it's a normal LoRa device. So we normally use the, the SX1262 from Semtech. Um, and obviously, we were very interested to also do this with the LR1110. So the first test we wanted to do is to see if it can actually do the modulation we use to the satellite. So we verified all that, and it's all covered, because basically, the LoRa functionality is very similar to what's already in the, in the 1262. The thing that makes it such a nice match for what we do is that because we send to the satellite, we already need to have a view of the sky. So adding a G GNSS antenna is, is very, very simple. We already have very good reception. So with just a very brief scan, we can already get all the information we need. Here in the picture is the first device we actually built. Um, there the antenna is, is separate, but we also have options where we can integrate our satellite antenna with the GNSS antenna. Now, what it makes really interesting for me, because as you can also see on this picture, there's already a footprint for a U-Blox, uh, which we had on the, on the previous version of the board, is the low power aspect. Uh, because I'm sometimes a little bit annoyed that everybody calls any product they make low power, and that's just not simply not true, especially in the satellite industry. Every other solution I know about takes a lot of power to send to the satellite. So you need a huge battery. Um, if I here have an example from Soft, this is a battery which has something like seven ampere hour of capacity. And with that, you can send, uh, you, you can use two amps of, of instantaneous power. That works perfectly, but in my view, it's not low power. The battery you see there is a very small, a small LiPo battery of 250 milliamp hour. Um, so the, the total capacity is limited, but also the power it can source instantaneously is, is limited. If your device runs on such a battery or even on a super cap, which we also do, then it's low power. And that's where the LR1110 comes in for us. Because in our application, we have something that we're tracking, either a ship or a container or an animal, which we need to locate a few times per day, let, let's say every six or three hours. If we do this with a normal GPS, it takes a long time every time to get a fix, Ex exactly what, uh, what Luca has, has measured and showed in, the, in his blog. So the power consumption for the GPS to get a fix is huge. While with the 1110, we can get within a few seconds, all the data we need forwarded to the satellite and have our position fix. So it's really about the low power aspect of this. So running it on a very small battery and therefore also in a very small footprint or even on a super cap. So we have done experiments where we have a, a plant powered device that can actually send to a satellite. And with the same plant power, we could also run this uh, uh, GNSS uh, scanning, which you would never be able to do with a normal uh, GPS. So that's the main uh, reason we are so interested in, in this board or in this, uh, in the, in this chip. 
And that brings all kinds of uh, uh, additional benefits as well. For example, if we do a very quick uh, GPS scan, we can see if we have sky visibility. So if we don't see any GPS satellites, we also know that we're not going to see our own satellite. So maybe the device is inside, for example. We can do a Wi-Fi scan and we know whether we're in a remote area or in an urban area. So that it gives us a lot much awareness about where the device is and what the situation of the device is. So for us, it's a perfect match. Um, we tested the output power to the satellite, we tested the sensitivity, we tested the, the, the GPS performance, and it, uh, it all works uh, as we expect. So we started with the development board that Luca also showed, and then we, uh, we got a few chips to uh, see if we could actually build our own device. My colleague, uh, Joost Kauweiser, who, who just walked out, so I can't show him right now, <laughs> built, uh, sorry, built this board for us. <clears throat> it's a little bit more complicated than the board we had before. It's a four layer PCB now. We literally copied the reference design from Semtech as a start to see if we could get the same performance. And that actually worked on the first run. So uh, the board we built uh, is exactly the same as the reference design, but then integrated with the rest of our hardware. And it has exactly the same performance as the development board had. On the next iteration, we're probably going to change it a little bit, but we first wanted to make sure this would work. Then on the testing, so Luca has done uh, a very uh, uh, detailed uh, analysis. Uh, I started much simpler. Uh, I just simply put the device on the bike for my kids, uh, sent them away with some head start, and then uh, tried to follow them by uh, parsing the data and sending it to Laura Cloud to resolve it, uh, to see if I could find them. Uh, they liked it a lot, and it worked every time, which is another proof that actually the, the, the location accuracy is uh, uh, at least good enough to find your children back. So that, that was my simple test, but Luca has done a much more better analysis. So that's basically it uh, for us. Here's an, a real example. Um, this is not with the LR1110. This is a device that's already uh, on the sea for like six months. So it has a normal GPS on it from, from Ublox. But this is a perfect example of what we could do with the LR1110. It's a sailing boat. Um, it's sending a standard lower one message from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean uh, and we can locate it. And uh, next time we have a boat like this, we will definitely put the uh, LR1110 on it and uh, uh, track it that way. So that's what we, what we have done uh, with it so far and, and uh, the main reasons why we're so much uh, interested in it. Luca? Perfect. Thank you, Thomas, very much uh, for your presentation. Um, so I see we have um, two questions uh, for you. Um, I suggest you answer them in text in the Q&A and we'll go over to Fabienne uh, to uh, have the presentation uh, from him uh, and over to you, Orne. Perfect, Fabienne, go ahead. Okay, so um, of course, um, so I'm, I'm professor at Université Côte d'Azur and I'm also part of uh, Everything's company. So, and my, my main topic is uh, working on antennas and RF circuits. So, of course, I will be uh, talking about this um, this subject. Um, so, first, before starting on, on on the GPS side, just to tell you that uh, the LR uh, 1110 is is uh, you have to to see to to, to see this uh, chip as a software defined radio platform with multiple RF path. So, what is nice is that of course you can use it as a um, we classically use it, so uh, you, you, you have a path for LoRa, a path for GPS, and a path for Wi-Fi. But when you see the frequency that can be achieved with uh, the RF path, you see that you potentially can do uh, a lot of more things. So, but of course, it, in, it includes uh, the fact that you need to have a lot of antennas <laughs> um, included in your, in, your, in your development boards. So just if we focus on the, on the GPS, what is uh, a, a very unique feature uh, from the uh, LR1110 is really that the GPS scan can be very short. Uh, usually when we, you do a call start for any GPS receiver, you need at least 30 seconds to, to, get, the, to get the fix. So of course, it's not possible to, to play with different antennas and, and, and then to, to try uh, antenna diversity. But then as uh, with this chip, you can do scan uh, on a very short time, so less than uh, 0.5 seconds then it became possible to play on antenna diversity. And um, 
so I've been looking a little bit in literature and I find this great uh, paper from Calgary. Uh, we were um, comparing detection performance for especially using polarization or spatial diversity for indoor uh, um, GNSS uh, localization. So if you are interested, um, you can easily find the paper or just send me an email, we'll send it to you. But they compare a lot of different strategy, including playing on circular polarization, playing on different linear polarization, or playing on, on, on spatial diversity. And, and they show that basically you can always gain some, some, so what we call the diversity gain is the increase in signal to noise ratio, typically thanks to this strategy. And the average uh, improvement is between uh, three and four dB, which, which, which is huge for, for, for GPS uh, uh, reception. Um, and it seemed that the, the best one for the, the article was the circular polarization diversity. So just to show you that uh, it, it's not so much complex to integrate um, different antennas in, in the short form factor. Uh, this is a, a small uh, simulation or design of a, a credit card size PCB that includes three GPS antennas. So you have the, here in the center of the classical uh, ceramic GPS antenna. And then I add two um, small PCB antenna on, on each side. Um, and, uh, and here you can see, uh, depending on the antenna you will select, of course, you will have different pattern. And so you imagine that, of course, if the antenna is facing the sky, uh, it's better to use the ceramic antenna because, of course, it will have the, the best radiation pattern. But, of course, this type of small tracker can be in different orientation. And, of course, for example, if you flip completely the, 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 the board, uh, the ceramic antenna cannot get any satellite. And then you can play with uh, the other antennas to try to find a way to, to at least get some, some uh, information from the, from the GPS. Uh, and you see that def definitely if you use uh, the different uh, PCB antenna, you can point in different direction. And even what you can do is to use uh, the two PCB antenna and to, to, to fed the two antennas at the same time with a phase difference. And then you can even generate some additional pattern. So um, it shows you that in a very simple way, you can, you can uh, add diversity. So this is spatial diversity, typically. So you can point your, point your GPS antenna in, in different direction. And just to show you if we want to do some um, um, circular polarization diversity, so typically you will switch between right or left-handed uh, polarization. So uh, I forget to tell you something very important. Why it's very interesting to play with uh, circular polarization diversity is mainly because you have to think that when you have a, a signal, so the signal from the, the sky, from the GPS satellite, are, are coming with right and uh, circular polarization. But once you have a reflection, so especially if you are working in, in, uh, in urban environment, certainly you will have reflection from the building. And when you have a, a reflection, it will turn the right uh, and circular polarization to a left hand. So if you can play with the two um, uh, direction for the polarization, you have more chance to have a good signal and, 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 to, and to get the, the localization. And to do so, it, it's not really hard. Uh, you just need to, to, to purchase a, a classical ceramic patch antenna, but you can find this ceramic patch antenna with two feed. So the two feed, thanks to the two feed, in fact, and if you associate with an hybrid coupler, which is not so hard to design, you can, you can have two ports, and on the two ports, typically, uh, you can have all the right-hand circular polarization. So you see for, for my, my small board I design here, I can get a 5 dBi of gain, so 5 dB IC, because I get the, the, the circular polarization. Uh, so all the right, all the left, depending on the port I select. And, and, and you have not, uh, you do not need to add an additional antenna. You just are using the same antenna, but in a more clever way. So just to conclude uh, this short um, um, this short uh, presentation, so think that thanks to the antenna diversity, LR10, uh, 1110 has the potential to extend the GNSS applicability. Also, I would say in light indoor environments, so when you are close to you are indoor but close to a window. Um, just something also, if you are a little bit afraid to have too many antennas, think, uh, think also that you can have some antenna combo that will integrate uh, different uh, uh, standards on the same antenna. For example, uh, this small board uh, I designed uh, some years ago, uh, the, the top antenna integrate both 
a LoRa and a GPS antenna. So you can see that you can still have a very form, fa form factor, but with antenna that can do more than just uh, the single resonance. Uh, then we are investigating, investigating with Semtech uh, uh, the use of ceramic patch and PCB genesis antenna implementation. Uh, and then uh, with Lacuna, we are also looking to integrate uh, the LR1110 in, in a very small form factor where we, we will have both the chip and the antenna uh, in, in something very, very, very compact. So this is just initial design that we have been, uh, we have been starting. So. So thanks a lot, uh, Luca, for invitation, and uh, and I think we can go to the uh, third pan panelist. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Fabian, for the presentation. Um, I'll kindly ask you to go to the Q and A tab and answer some questions um, there. Um, and over to you, Orne. So um, hello, everybody. My name is Orne Luca. I'm the author of ChirpSec. Uh, ChirpSec is an open source LoRaWAN network server. So when you are going to set up your own LoRaWAN um, network, you need to have a network server. And this is where the ChirpStack project uh, steps in. So if you go to chirpstack.io, you can download all the different components. To briefly summarize um, um, uh, the, the, the different components of uh, ChirpStack, um, there is one component which you can run on the gateway, which allows you to um, communicate between the gateway and the cloud um, using MQTT. Um, then there is a component called the ChirpStack network server, which acts as the LoRaWAN network server. And finally, there is a component called the ChirpStack application server. So in the past, ChirpStack already supported geolocation using TDOA. So there was an um, external component, which we call the geolocation server, which uh, already integrated with LoRa Cloud. But with the um, uh, release of the LR11, then um, I'm now moving um, um, this geolocation part into the application server. Since um, previously it was only dealing with the metadata, which is available uh, as you don't have to decrypt the LoRaWAN payload. But when you're dealing with the LR1110 um, uh, GNSS uh, data or uh, Wi-Fi scanning data, you first need to decrypt the data before you can do anything sensible with it. Um, so I'm happy to announce that um, it hasn't been um, officially released yet, but ChirpStack is going to uh, support uh, a LoRa Cloud integration, which can be configured through the application server. So um, to quickly show how that's going to look like is when you um, are under an application and you um, are uh, setting up the LoRa Cloud integration, you can enable uh, geolocation support. You can define if you want to use TDOA, um, RSSA-based Wi-Fi, or uh, GNSS. So the, um, um, especially the GNSS part uh, is related to the LR1110. Uh, the Wi-Fi base um, can be used together with the LR1110, but also can be uh, used with, um, for example, the LoFi, which also has a, a Wi-Fi module. Um, um, so this allows you to configure this. So um, what you need to do is when you uh, are registered at uh, loracloud.com, um, which is a uh, provided by Semtech, you configure um, a, a security token, uh, which you enter here. Um, and for the GNSS, uh, you configure which payload field contains um, either the GNSS data um, or the, the, the Wi-Fi payload. Um, and finally, you can uh, select if you want to use the, um, the, the timestamp received from the, the gateways or uh, the timestamp, which is part of the GNSS sniffing table. Um, so these two fields are important, and um, I'm going to show you uh, why. So in ChirpStack, you can uh, define a device profile. A device profile defines the capability of the device, but also how you want to encode and decode uh, the data. So if you are looking at the GNSS um, uh, device profile, um, this really depends on how you're going to use, but what this allows you to do is to combine the LR1110 GNSS data with other data, which could be, for example, the satellite count, uh, it could be um, status of the device, uh, basically anything which you want to um, include in your payload. And then you can split it up into different fields. As you can see, this field, um, uh, relates to uh, the GNSS payload field. 
So this allows you to uh, do your own payload decoding and then still using uh, it together with LoRa Plus. Um, the same um, is with the Wi-Fi um, scanning. So you can define a, a payload that decodes um, uh, potentially um, um, your own payloads together with the Wi-Fi scanning, um, and you um, uh, make sure that it's outputted in the, the right field, which is configured in the, the LoRa Cloud integration. Um, here, um, it, it's up to you to uh, name this. But this gives you the full flexibility to uh, implement. So uh, when you have set this up in the integration and when uh, a device sends either uh, a Wi-Fi payload or a GNSS uh, payload, um, then ChirpStack will uh, forward the data either to an HTTP endpoint, MQDT, InfluxDB, uh, Postgres database, uh, AMQP, uh, ThingsBoard, Google Cloud PubSub, um, um, AWS SNS, or um, an Azure uh, service bus, and then you can um, visualize it or use it uh, in your application. So that's um, a really quick uh, overview of how this is going to work uh, from the ChirpSec uh, perspective. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Orne, for uh, the presentation. Um, so I hope everyone got a good insight in like what's possible, how things work, and so forth. But I'm quite sure there's quite a number of open questions now um, and really understanding the solution end to end um, how it works. So today you have this covered here in the panel. Um, so I would invite everyone to post questions either in the chat um, or in the Q&A section um, as well. And as you do this, uh, we can open up a bit of um, discussion with um, a general question on like, what are the things you see LRE 10, 10 really unlocks? Um, so we've mentioned low power and yeah, really optimizing the solution as Fabian mentioned to even a sub-second acquisition is order of magnitudes than um, the other available solutions. But what do you think are like really the unique things that could not be built thus far uh, without this? Thomas, maybe you can make a start. Sure, sure. Uh, I think as with uh, as with so many things with 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 Laura, um, there's always another way of doing it. So, but with Laura, uh, for all kind of IoT applications, it's it's cheaper and simpler. And this is like an extension of that. So, of course, you can put a separate GPS on it and a bigger battery and and, and everything. But now everything is in one device. Uh, it's low power, etc. It brings everything together, so it's it's simpler and cheaper, and that in the end allows you to to scale and make more devices and serve use cases that don't have a huge margin on them. So I think that's that's the main benefit, other than that it has features that you could not do any other way. It's just like uh, uh, cheaper, simpler, and sometimes even a better way of uh, of, of doing it, and therefore making things things possible. Just think about it. You have a chip that that can actually talk to a gateway, it can talk to a satellite, it can receive uh, G GPS signals, it can locate itself with Wi-Fi and it has uh, security in, in there all in one chip. That's a big step forward, I think. Perfect. And yourself, Fabian, what's your take on this? No, I would say clearly, I mean, for I mean, asset tracking, where you, you want to have your device to be always available, uh, uh, several fixed a day and, 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 and able to run on a very small battery for, for several years. I mean, at, the, at this time, there is no solution. And I mean, the only solution is, is clearly the LR1110. So um, this is clearly enabling some, 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 some unique feature that uh, were not available before on the market. Perfect. And yourself, Orna, do you have a take on this? Um, yeah, that's on the device uh, side, more on the software side. But what I do know from uh, the Chirpsec users is that a lot of people expect that with uh, regular, uh, like Raspberry Pi gateways, they are able to do uh, geolocation uh, while it's uh, due to the, the time um, um, accuracy. It's not really a, a, an option. So I think. With LR1110, when it becomes like the, the mainstream uh, chipset uh, used for LoRa devices, 
this makes it even possible to, if you have a Raspberry Pi based gateway, to do uh, proper um, geolocation with your uh, devices. And I think that's uh, a huge benefit to uh, a lot of users since most of the users, they start with a simple gateway. They don't have the, the money to invest like in a tree or more uh, Cisco or Curling um, um, uh, geolocation capable gateways. Thank, thank you for this. Yeah, this is very, very interesting to hear. Um, I see we have a number of questions uh, from our participants, uh, so we can dive um, into um, those. Um, so starting in no particular order, I see Nicholas is asking uh, that he's not sure if uh, the device is available to send a payload like any LoRaWAN device or is it just a beacon? Um, so jumping back into the LR1110 operation, uh, it is really just a LoRaWAN transceiver, which works as any other LoRa uh, and LoRaWAN device essentially. And in addition, it has two receive paths for Wi-Fi MAC addresses and for GNSS data um, that you can then pack into a LoRaWAN payload and just send across. Um, and on the um, server side, this gets resolved in the cloud uh, through the LoRa Edge um, and yeah, using the mechanism uh, Orna mentioned. Um, we have also a question from uh, Ibra um, on the LR1110 uh, GNSS sensitivity. Um, so Fabien, you have a closer understanding on this, how it compares with the usual yeah, GPS chip sensitivity of minus 160 dB or so. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can recommend on the sensitivity because you know the um, it's clearly doing something different because you you consider that you have already the almanac and uh, so of course you, you need a, a lower sensitivity compared with a classical uh, uh, GNSS reserver where, where you need to decode the almanac typically. But what I could say that from what, what I experience, I would say that once you have the almanac uh, on board, uh, you have a, a similar performance with the best chip you can find on the market. And, and this is what you show with the U-blocks. You get similar performance in terms of, uh, of, uh, of um, positioning uh, accuracy. But of course, I mean, if you can get this, it's just because you already, you already get the almanac, uh, which help you to relax the constraint on the, on the receiver. I mean, mm -hmm. think that there is no magic in, the, in this chip. I mean, if, if you can get uh, so much lower power consumption, it's because you, you, we are using something more, so something already available, which is uh, the Almanac, which is what you need to, to, to update. Uh, every, actually, I think every three months, you need to update the Almanac on, on the chip to, to, to make the position. Yeah, so we haven't really talked about uh, Almanac uh, in great detail, um, so that's definitely of interest um, of our participants, I believe. Um, so as far as I understand, Semtech is releasing an Almanac update about every two weeks, uh, meaning that uh, they, yeah, that you get an update then, and then you can send it to the device about once a month to keep it updated, and then it's valid for three months. Um, but the question also uh, stands, um, how well does this work without Almanac, or yeah, how? what happens if it's stale and so forth. Um, do you guys have any take on that? Um, yeah, personally, it's true that if you are not uh, including the Almanac, the performance, of course, is really reduced compared to a classical GPS receiver. So you, it's possible to do it, but, uh, but I mean, here you really see a difference with the classical, uh, uh, very good uh, GPS receiver. And Thomas, do you have any thoughts? This topic? Yeah, it, it's uh, I've seen the same as, uh, as as Fabian. So without an almanac, you need a very good antenna and a very clear sky view. Then it 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 it, it works fine. So it's much better to keep the almanac up to date. And also the almanac you can split in small parts, so you don't have to update it all at once. Uh, uh, you can actually uh, spread it over time and update parts of it. Um, for our specific use case, we're also going to uh, we're looking into distributing the almanac as part of the information we distribute over the satellite uh, to make it available in completely remote places over a longer time as well. Perfect, yeah. So I've seen quite a few questions uh, come in on the Almanac uh, part. Um, 
so there's another question. Um, if you can use RSSI for locating early 1110 in Wi-Fi geolocation, and does yeah does one LoRa one gateway determine the location in that case? Um, so yeah, for, provided the Wi-Fi uh, scan returns enough MAC addresses from neighboring uh, hotspots, uh, LoRa Edge will resolve those. Uh, in the cloud and you can get the position back. So assuming in a city um, or essentially yeah, where also your computer or similar just Wi-Fi device uh, can get location from the scans, this would work the same, but at very, very, very uh, low power. Um, so there's another question um, for uh, yourself, Orna, in terms of uh, using the LR1110 um, and like what solvers are required. Maybe Thomas, you can weigh in on this at a later point as well. Yeah, for the GNSS part, um, currently uh, from the TripStack point of view, I'm only using um, uh, the LoRa Cloud um, uh, solver. Um, I haven't looked into what would be needed to support other solvers. From the Wi-Fi perspective, um, currently LoRa Cloud is supported. But I also know that, uh, for example, Mozilla um, um, offers a Mozilla uh, location service, which can be used um, free of charge, uh, I believe up to like 100,000 requests or 10,000 requests uh, per day uh, for non-commercial and open source uh, use cases. Um, so that could be a potential um, integration to add in the future. And um, there are more databases with regards to uh, Wi-Fi since there are many different um, sources uh, with uh, Wi-Fi access point data. But for the GNSS part, um, I haven't looked into it yet. Yeah. Any other thoughts, guys, on this topic? Right, yeah. So um, I see a few more uh, questions uh, coming in. Um, on different uh, applications. Um, quite a few are uh, more related to um, the topics uh, Semtech can um, answer directly. So we'll leave some of them uh, unanswered. Um, I see also there's uh, some Semtech people uh, in this call. So feel free to uh, raise a hand and we can give you an opportunity to answer uh, some of those later on. But before um, we move forward, um, I would like to ask you guys the question of what is the next thing you are building with LR1110? Uh, Thomas, you mentioned briefly already that you're doing an integrated board on your end. Uh, is there something else you're coming up with? Well, that's that's indeed the first thing we will uh, work on is, it, is a tracker that has both satellite connectivity and uh, GPS scanning uh, and also works terrestrial, but that's uh, that, that's for us the uh, the ultimate first use case. Yeah. Perfect. And Fabian, yourself? Yeah, personally, I, I would like to use the, the chip. In fact, to 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 make a multi-standard uh, um, device. Uh, so because um, if you look at the at the chip, in fact, you can also uh, have, for example, at the same time the 868 megahertz band, and also, for example, a 400 megahertz. Uh, Compatibility because you have a two um, two RF output, so you can optimize the two RF for two for the two frequencies, uh, and you can design a, a dual band uh, a receiver uh, part. So I mean, you imagine that uh, with, the, with the chip you can have uh, you can support the 400 megahertz band, the 800 megahertz band, the GPS, and also have the support of the of the Wi-Fi. So uh, with a single chip, so this is uh, this is quite amazing. So typically, this is something I'm, I would try to focus on. And of course, on the antenna part <laughs> to make Perfect. it compact. And yourself, Orne? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm less on the device side. Um, I'm more on the, the software side. But from the chirp stack perspective, I want to make it as easy as possible to, for people to get started with the LR1110 uh, uh, without any need to um, build um, your own application to integrate with LoRa Cloud. So in the end, it should work um, as easy as possible with a few clicks and uh, people should get a, their location out of the, the LR1110 uh, based devices. 
Very interesting. Yeah, and likewise on our end here uh, at IRNAS, we're working on LR1110 uh, integration into various products. Um, definitely this, we'll be working on this tracker, uh, doing the new generation implementation with LR1110, likely combining two GNSS solutions uh, in one device so we can switch between say a traditional receiver and LR1110 and then use it at the same time uh, to send LoRaWAN messages for like really the toughest uh, cases of positioning where it's somewhat less about the cost but it's much more about performance um, and battery life. And at the same time, yeah, coming up with more integratable modules and concepts that uh, we can very quickly trial uh, with our customers on creating new projects, proof of concepts, and taking things to the field um, as soon as possible. We have um, a few more questions um, as well available. Um, so I see uh, Maria Kalma has raised uh, her hand to talk. So I'll invite uh, Maria to say what's uh, on her mind um, and then feel free um, so Remy or anyone else from Sentech joining us feel free to raise your hand and we can give you a moment to say a few things we've not covered well so here we go we have Maria joining us Is Maria around? Unfortunately not. So we can uh, circle back uh, later. Um, does anyone have any further questions? No, uh, maybe I can just comment on something which we, we, we do not mention too much, but um, uh, what is also nice with the, with, with the, the chip is that it's integrated in fact uh, MCU. So we, can, we can't use the MCU, but think that uh, after time uh, the, the the, the chip will evolve itself, and uh, and this is something that uh, Nicolas Sorna uh, mentioned, uh, so CTO of, uh, of Semtech, that new features will be activated uh, um, in, in the future uh, with the chip, and uh, so this is something that is going to be updated uh, year after year. So with the same hardware, in fact, you will be able to to enable uh, more, uh, more 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 features and, and, and improvement also in the in the, in the sensitivity of the of the GPS and so on. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so we are really looking forward to all improvements in the you know, solvers and yeah, it's, it's easy to update things on the cloud, which is very nice compared to updating the device and adding new features, particularly if you have it in the field uh, for a number of years. Um, so looking at the uh, questions, um, we see quite a few uh, about the drivers for LRE1110 and what's um, available um, out there for this at the moment. Um, so Thomas, maybe you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, um, um, if you look at uh, the GitHub account from Semtech called, I think it's called github.com slash Laura dash net. Um, there is a driver there that has all the functionality for the chip. It's, it's in very uh, uh, platform independent C. Uh, we ported it to the Arduino platform to, in, to make it part of our own library, which was very trivial to do. Uh, so even if it's not supported on your preferred platform, uh, adding that support yourself is, is not, not a big task. It should be relatively easy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, likewise, and we've tried this on our end. Um, it works well. It's there. It supports features. Um, and you need to write your essentially SPI function integrations and you're more or less uh, good to go. Um, so likewise, um, here at Nidras, and we are working on integrating this uh, into Zephyr RTOS to make um, integration with Nordic Semiconductor, Bluetooth devices, uh, uh, and BIT devices, and so forth. And yeah, so far, the progress is good, and it's not been too painful, really. Um, so, Luca, it's probably also good to mention that uh, there's now LR1110 support in the, in the LoRaWAN stack from Semtech on the same GitHub account. Perfect. Yeah. So there's plenty of new things uh, happening and integration should be uh, quite helpful. Um, so I see another uh, question or, well, uh, advice from Frank uh, saying that LR1110 may be quite interesting also for drone identification purposes, Yeah, which is definitely not the application I've had uh, in mind before. Uh, 
but yeah, should yeah, drone tracking in real time and identification uh, need to be implemented, this would be quite a nice way to build a real time tag at a reasonably low price and you could just stick uh, this on there. Um, right, so we are uh, nearing the end of this uh, webinar. Um, I'll ask for one final round um, of questions. Um, before we do a closing go round of our panelists. Um, so we have a question, um, a few questions I believe for yourself, uh, Thomas, in the Q&A section. So you maybe wish to uh, answer some of them live here, relate more to Lacuna functionality. I see there's a question about the ground stations. Um, uh, once the service is, uh, is operational, we will uh, 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 publicize what, where the ground stations are and, and what the delay is between picking up a message and, uh, and sending it uh, back down. Um, there's also a question here, not specifically for me, but if the LoRa, if you require an Internal LoRa transceiver, but that's not the case. So the LoRa transceiver is integrated in the LR1110. It's everything in one chip. Uh, I think that's it, Luca, for the questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have about reliability question. Yeah, so we had a very high success rate in getting GNSS uh, fixes in all our experiments, as we've posted. Um, so yes, like if you have a strong enough uh, signal and a good antenna in your outdoors, this works perfectly. So we don't see any uh, limitations on that. And Fabian has been already uh, quite detailed um, on this topic um, already. Um, unless you want to add something, Fabian. To it. Uh, no, for, for Thomas, there was a question about the size of the element. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, EE. I know that we need to 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 upload the Amanac each one month or three months, but uh, is it a, is it a big uh, a big packet or? Um, as far as I know, it's about two kilobytes uh, if you do a full Amanac update, but you can do it partially over all our sections over time. And Thomas, I believe you experimented a bit more with that. Yeah, exactly. So the, the full size is two kilobytes, but you can update it in parts, but also you don't need to update everything. So the amount of data you need to update is much smaller than two kilobytes. Okay. Um, Perfect, so I believe we are ready for a final uh, go round. Who wants to go first? I'll, uh, I'll start again. Um, so uh, also during this whole discussion, I, I uh, again realized that it's it's all about uh, data fusions. I mean, you have this chip that, does, that has LoRa in it, but also it can scan Wi-Fi and GPS. It's also about using all this data. So it's not either Wi-Fi or GPS or another localization mechanism. It's about seeing what's available, what makes sense to do and making smart choices. Um, we are also working on a geolocation methods. So from space, we can actually see where your device is not with the accuracy of a GPS, of course, but still uh, in, the, in the kilometer range. And we're trying to merge that data together with the data that comes from the, uh, from the LoRa Edge chip, such that even if you don't have complete information from GPS, you can combine it with what we have. So it's all about making smart combinations of data. And I think that's one of the main benefits of this new uh, platform. Perfect, yeah, that, that is a very exciting opportunity, particularly because there are so many sources that you can really pull things together. And yeah, even if you had an extra Bluetooth chip uh, on the board, which is quite likely for a lot of applications, you then have like a triple or a quadruple radio interface and yeah, joining all of that together can be quite helpful. Um, Fabian, over to yeah, you. Yeah, I, 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 I will have, I think, a similar comment about the data fusion and so on, because I, I forget to mention that, for example, so when you have multiple antennas, you can also use accelerometer, for example, to know what is the position of your, of your device to find the, the best antenna. But what is sure is that, I mean, this, the LR1110 is more than a chip. It, it opens really an ecosystem where you can merge a lot of different standards and, and make something, I mean, it's not just one problem, one plus one is equal to two. I mean, you, you can really uh, extract some, some, some beautiful features by mixing all the different stuff. And the fact that uh, you can also, the chip will evolve itself uh, time after time. It shows that we will certainly discover new, new, new techniques and new way and it will uh, improve time after time the, the, the performance of the, of the system. So, so I think it's really promising. 
Perfect, thank you. And over uh, to yourself, Orna. Yeah, so if people are interested to play with this, um, I believe we already have a test release, uh, including the first version of the LoRa Cloud integration. Um, it will be included in one of the next uh, releases, so please provide feedback um, and make sure that uh, well, it will be useful to everybody. So looking forward to feedback. So people will find uh, all the information on chirpstack.io. Um, there have already been some announcements on uh, the forum, which you can find on forum.sherpstack.io. And uh, yeah, please share your feedback. Perfect. So thank you very much, uh, guys, for this. Yeah, likewise, at INES, we are moving in the direction of building full solutions uh, with this, doing plenty on the data logic, uh, figuring out how to best combine this for uh, certain applications, uh, sorting out the drivers and all the details uh, so one can readily test this. Um, but particularly, yeah, building demonstrators as really as soon as possible, as like quickly as possible, getting things out in the field, getting all the data and then being smart about it, uh, so to speak. Uh, and that is uh, really what this enables. Um, so that brings us uh, to the end. I believe uh, we have answered um, all the questions. Um, so thank you very much, Thomas, Fabienne, and Orne for participating um, today. Um, I hope this has been uh, useful for everyone participating. Um, I see about 100 people attended uh, today, which is a very good turnout. And thank you for all the questions. Um, and please reach out to either of us uh, with any questions uh, you guys may have. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everyone for participating and uh, till next time. Thanks a lot for organizing this <laughs> great event. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Leka. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.